Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... At Villeray's Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villeray's provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villeray's Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, you know we're covering all the home teams. We'll talk Saints, we'll talk Pelicans, we'll talk LSU Tigers. I don't know if we'll get to the Tulane Green Wave. Not a lot going on with the Wave right now. It's coming, though, for you Wave fans. And to break it down, look, i got to tell you right now, anytime I'm in the car in the evening time, even sometime when I'm in the house, I'm turning this guy on. I think he is, hands down, one of the best talk show hosts we have in the city. I got knowledgeable, great delivery, keeps you entertained and informed. Seth Dunlap of WWL Radio is with us tonight. Seth, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us. And man, I'll tell you what, knocking it out the park every night over at right, the Thanks, WWL. man. You know, I work on I work for Twitter. Uh, that's right. what that's what people do now, I yes. guess. <laughs> we work for Twitter. Uh, no, it's eight to eleven every night. It's uh, double coverage now, the last lap on WWL. Mm -hmm. And it's also write daily columns and blogs. You can get a WWL.com, radio.com app, and lots of stuff to talk about yeah. right now, which is interesting because it's June. This is usually it's the dead, dead, dead time dead here. Period. It's anything but dead. No, we dread this time, right? We do. I mean, if you're in a baseball market, you don't dread this nope. time because, again, you're rolling right now, going, getting ready to get into the All Star break, and you know, then of course you have the Fourth of July pennant races, etc. But in, in New Orleans, you know, it's football, football, football. Now Pelicans. When when the college baseball season ends, when it ever ends with LSU or maybe Tulane or UNO, when when when, when they're uh, playing well and getting to a College World Series. Fingers crossed for next season. You know, it kind of goes dead because you know. Again, both I, you and I were talking before we came on the show. Mini camp, you know, just you know, it's not much to it. But this Anthony Davis thing has kind of kept us afloat here with again some riveting talk to really kind of talk about what's going on there. So. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in a roundabout way, thank you, Rich Paul. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you know? no, no doubt about it. Thank you for making our jobs a lot easier yes. over the next couple of months. No, no doubt, doubt about, about it. it. Uh, last time you were on, we talked a little bit about the front office changes with the Pelicans. The, this week, uh, they, they do something a, a little bit out of the box here, but I think it's a great move. Swin Cash hired as the vice president of basketball operations in charge of team development. Your thoughts? Oh, Swin's great. Uh, she was in the front office in New York for the Liberty. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the Liberty are actually the best run basketball franchise in New York. Mm -hmm. It's not the Knicks. It was the New York Liberty. Would you tell Rich Paul that? Yeah, Rich, exactly. <laughs> please. Uh, Anthony Davis going to uh, in New York. If he's going to go there, make him Brooklyn, not uh, right. not the Knicks for his sake. But Swin's great. She's, a, I believe, a five-time All-Star. She's, she's won an Olympics. She's um, going to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, in the WNBA, and I, I believe she actually is uh, my age, and I only say that because I've been that kind of young, following. Huh? I've been kind of following her career since I was in high school. I, yeah. I want to say she she went to college in, in 2002 or right. graduated college in 2002. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to watch her career arc, and uh, kind of like Becky Hammond. Becky mm -hmm. Hammond is already in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Everybody believes next few years she's going to get a head coaching I job. Uh, Swin wants to go the front office mm -hmm. route, and I believe that she will be either a GM or mm -hmm. uh, running a basketball franchise. Yeah. Uh, sometime down the road. I think she's that talented, and David Griffin said as much. Yeah, no doubt. And look, uh, we love diversity, and, and, and you look at the front office now, the diversity of that front office, you know, again, from the ownership all the way down, fantastic for, for the Pelicans, and really good for those 
that aspire to be in a front office or aspire to get into professional sports. Yeah. Okay? The, the, well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you have a, a, a female owner. You've got a, a minority a general manager yes. in Trajan Langton. Right. You've got a minority head coach mm -hmm. in Alvin Gentry. The, the diversity sometimes is more lip service when you get to these professional franchises, True. especially in the uh, even in the NBA mm -hmm. when you talk about the front offices. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Pelicans are kind of putting their money where their mouths are. Yeah, no Let's get into it, the, the biggest story of the last few weeks, and it may linger into next week. It may linger into next month. Uh, we're not sure right now. It is the season of misinformation, folks. For those of you that are locked on Twitter, locked on Facebook, uh, Instagram, whatever your, uh, your favorite social media site is, or you know, can't get enough on talk radio, we love that, by the way, uh, or again on this show. Uh, I guess we start with Rich Paul. And the, the, the calculated uh, War and Peace article, and I say War and Peace because that, that was a long article uh, in Sports Illustrated, you know, trying to maybe manipulate the process once again uh, in the favor of the Los Angeles Lakers and LeBron James by coming out and saying, you know, anyone can, can, can bring uh, Anthony Davis in, but it's a one-year rental. He's going into free agency in 2020. What was your reaction when you read that article? Yeah, I, I try to separate my professional stance on this from my, my Pelicans fandom. And yes. it's, it's tough, especially when we see what's transpired mm -hmm. over here the last few months since Anthony Davis made the trade request. I will say this, from strictly an agent perspective, I kind of respected the leverage play mm -hmm. by Rich Paul. Right. I mean, that was a nuclear bomb that he dropped. And another we'll get to some one, of the, right? Yeah, another one. He's dropped a few of these. Yeah. But this was his ace in the hole. And going to Sports Illustrated and finally going on record... Even though Anthony Davis has said before, there's no list to David Griffin, there's no list of preferred franchises. AD was on the record before saying that, so we can get to the hypocrisy here. But from a leverage play, from an agent perspective, remember, he's paid to um, get Anthony Davis uh, the best money and also get Anthony Davis to the franchise that he wants. Now, I respect that, but the questions that I have are, um, we know who's the puppet master behind all this. Yes, we do. Rich Paul and LeBron James have been friends since childhood. Mm -hmm. LeBron James has his fingertips all over this. LeBron James has made you know, no bones about he wants Anthony Davis in Los Angeles. AD is a grown man. Despite what he says, he dresses himself every day. I, I, uh, I hope so. Does, right? I, like, I right. hope so. Um, so if he didn't want his agent to say that, if he didn't want to go to the Lakers or Knicks, and those were his destination, mm -hmm. um, he could have said that or he could have refuted that. He never did that. So that tells me that Rich Paul is doing what Anthony Davis wants. Mm -hmm. So stepping back, uh, here from the passion that we have in the city for our basketball program, our basketball franchise. Uh, I do respect that. However, I don't like the underhanded tactics and also the, the vitriol that yes. Rich Paul seems to have for this franchise right. in this this city. Where does it, it come from? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I would assume that his relationship, and he mentioned this, with mm -hmm. Del Demps mm -hmm. was so toxic towards the end of it right. that it, it, that I feel, and I do think that he felt like he was slighted in a big way. Mm -hmm. And you talk to agents out there, mm -hmm. and what he said is, is at least partially true, mm -hmm. that general managers, you're supposed to communicate through the agents right. on a lot of this, especially if you had that relationship, and especially if an agent reached out to you. Now, we've only heard Rich Paul's side on this. Right. We haven't heard from Dell Demps, but if it is true that Dell Demps decided to spur an Anthony mm -hmm. Davis' agent, I could see where Rich Paul mm -hmm. gets a little upset about that. But to spend the last four months lobbing all the bombs again at this franchise mm -hmm. and seemingly undercutting your own leverage, there's that word again, leverage, right. that you had in getting Anthony Davis where he wants, um, it, it hasn't done that. It hasn't served Anthony Davis in his best mm -hmm. interest. And I, I still do not believe that the Lakers are going to be able to come up with a package that is enticing enough to outbid somebody like the Boston Celtics or a three-way deal, yeah, with the New York Knicks, mm -hmm. which I feel like is, a, uh, from an asset standpoint and that third overall pick, maybe a little mm -hmm. more um, intriguing than we'll the Lakers. We'll get a little deeper into that in a moment. I want to go back to what you said about Dell Demps, because as part of that article, he is upset that after, again, he communicated with Dell Demps on a Friday saying that Anthony Davis was not going to re-sign, he was going to opt out. As a matter of fact, they wanted to be traded by the trading deadline. Uh, that uh, one of the reasons why he went public when Woj called him on Monday, like right, okay? Right. Woj called him on Monday, uh, was because that uh, he went directly to Anthony Davis. Look, Anthony Davis changed agents. Anthony Davis works for the Pelicans. Uh, he, up until this point, we thought Anthony Davis had a good relationship with Dell Demps. If the agent calls and tells you that, I don't know if, you know, as a, uh, just a, a layman person that's in the, in the media, just an everyday normal person, that, it, you know, that it, anybody has a fault with calling on Anthony Davis or speaking again, hey, Anthony, Rich Paul, talk to me. Wants to, you want to be traded. 
is, is, is that true, first of all? And then is there something we can do to mitigate that? And, you know, I mean, before he has to go to the owner and say, uh, Mrs. Benson, Mickey Loomis, uh, I just got a call from Rich Paul and uh, Anthony Davis wants to be traded by the trading deadline. Oh, by the way, to the Lakers. Because I think the first thing they're going to ask him is, well, did you talk to Anthony Davis? Yes. Okay, did you talk to AD to find out, first of all, is it true? Second of all, was the deal? How did he do this about face? Because remember, it was Anthony Davis that came out in the beginning of the season and said, I'm not talking about free agency. I'm not talking about opting in or opting out. I'm playing the season out. We're trying to get to a playoff, and, and we'll discuss all this at the end of the season. That about face happened before the All-Star break. And, of course, dominated the all-star break narrative as well. So I don't – and I've had problems with Dell Demps, okay, and his tenure here in New Orleans. Also, again, ownership, the lack of, of paying attention to this franchise. But I don't think Dell did, Del Demps did something egregious there. Well, the only thing that I would say is, and I agree, you would hope that your general manager has the relationships where they can communicate with their players. I think right. that was a, a systemic problem with the Pelicans mm -hmm. organization um, before the last year and something that David Griffin is already working very hard to rectify. Um, but uh, if, and again, we're only getting one side of the story, yes, so I, I do hope sometime soon that Dell Demps, for his own stake, really, mm -hmm. Um, comes out and actually gives his side of the story because it's only Rich Paul's side of the story. But if what Rich Paul said is true, and yes, uh, Del Demps did go to Anthony Davis and talk to Gail Benson about this, but then refused to call Rich Paul back, which is what Rich Paul is making it sound yes. like. Again, I, I don't want to assume that Rich Paul is lying to us unless we find out you know, it, it's, right. it's misinformation here. But if what Rich Paul has said is true, I do think that Del Demps committed a little bit of a, you know, a faux pas, break, right. broke one of the unwritten He should have called him back. Should have called him back. I would agree with that. And, and here's the thing, to your point, um, Del Demps did not have that, that tight relationship with the players that you have to in the NBA. Right. Danny Ainge has it mm -hmm. um, up in Boston. We know Bob Myers has it uh, oh. in Golden State. Yes. You saw him break down in that press conference. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was real emotion from yes, Bob. Um, from Bob Myers, and you talked to all the Warriors players there, which is what every franchise is trying to emulate, is what's happening over in Golden State. He has that tight-knit, really valued and trusted relationship mm -hmm. with all of his players. I think David Griffin is going to get there. Yeah, I think uh, so, too. He's got some work to do mm -hmm. uh, just to repair you know, the right. foundation of this franchise. Right. I would agree. Um, Rich Paul, uh, again, trying to leverage the, the Pelicans into making a deal with the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, I think the first question is, do they get this done, deal done before the, uh, the, the draft, or is it going to be after the draft? And, and, and I set that question up by saying that, and we talked about it before the show, if you don't covet the third or fourth pick, if you're not going to utilize that in a three-team deal, then what type of pressure is it on David Griffin to get this deal done before, before the draft? Well, I would assume, and David Griffin, and we've heard reports coming out of the Pelicans organization mm -hmm. that they want to get this done before the draft mm -hmm. because of that. Whether that's the third or fourth pick, three-way mm -hmm. trades, right. uh, pie-in-the-sky deals, my own. Maybe you can mm -hmm. swap trades and get up to number two. I don't know. But, yeah, I would assume that this gets done before uh, next Thursday. There certainly has been a little bit of a stalling here after this Rich Paul article. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, that was a leverage play by an agent. I get it. Again, I'm trying to step back and remain as neutral as I can about it. Um, but, Good luck. I, but I don't, I think it was Mark Stein earlier today, mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it, who says the Danny Ainge and the Celtics aren't, uh, they're not flummoxed by this at all. Right. Um, they still aren't coming off their wish and desire to keep Jason Tatum right. and uh, Jalen Brown and company and some of the assets that the Pelicans want, the players Pelicans want up in Boston. There's a negotiation that's mm -hmm. going to happen. But again, I go back to, if you just look at the assets here, the Boston Celtics have and more value yes. than they give back to the Pelicans here in a one-way deal, in a multi-trade deal, yes. than the Lakers can. I also want to say this, and I don't want to spoil anything we're going to talk about mm -hmm. later, but the reports of some of the stuff that the Lakers are, yeah. are reportedly offering here are, are eye-roll worthy, which is what yeah. you just did. Something like Brandon Ingram and uh, with the fourth overall right. pick and, Ball. and Lonzo Ball. Lonzo Ball has off-the-court issues. Mm -hmm. He's a good player, not a great right. player. He's got the baggage of his dad. Mm -hmm. Brandon Ingram has injury issues. Yes. The fourth overall pick isn't the sure thing here yeah. once you get past R.J. Right. Barrett and John Morant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's you can get that kind of deal at the trade deadline. Right. So if I'm David Griffin and I say, I don't think this is... A, a, the best deal that they can get. But if it is, if David Griffin and company finds out that the best deal they can get is that what Mark Stein reported that right. the Lakers are offering, Ball, Ingram, and the fourth overall pick, I'm holding on to Anthony Davis. I'm playing 50 games with him in Zion and yep. saying, hey, maybe you guys will get along here. Let's maybe tr go try to make a playoff run with yep. your last season in New Orleans and trade you at the deadline if we don't. I agree with you. I agree 100%. Uh, again, I think, again, he can, uh, Griffin continues to have the leverage. And, and I'll start there because – Let's look at the package that the Lakers had that Magic came up with, uh, Rob Palenka came up with at the trading deadline. 
It included all of their young stars. It included at least four number one picks over the next few years. To me, if I'm David Griffin, I'm starting, well, wait a minute. That's the offer we start with. Not this offer where you're holding Kuzma back, you know, where, where Josh Hart's not involved in, the, in this deal. You know, again, you throw all the young assets in there. You throw four. Of course, the Pelicans didn't know they'd have the fourth overall pick at that point. And then that's where the conversation starts. No, that's exactly where the conversation starts. And remember, from a Lakers perspective, they lost leverage this summer because the Celtics at the trade deadline were not able to enter these negotiations. Mm -hmm. They did not have the availability because of a rule yes. where they could have traded for Anthony Davis right. um, at the trade deadline. Two, one, two players on their rookie maximum contract. Correct. And now once that Kyrie Irving uh, gets past that, mm -hmm. uh, gets past this June 30th deadline, they can actually make that deal. But this idea that Rob Palinka needs to save face by decreasing his offer to the Pelicans is is a little bit ludicrous, and he, he's he's playing with you know one of the one of the sharks here yes. in this poker game that is NBA general managers. I mean, David Griffin knows what he's doing. Danny Ainge also knows what he's doing. Right. I got to be frank, Rob Palinka with what he's done the last few years in the Lakers. Got to wonder if he actually knows right. exactly what he's doing there, and if it's him or if it's LeBron James that's running that franchise. And, and, and I will say one more time, and I know it's been said ad nauseum here, but it deserves to be said until Anthony Davis is not here anymore. When he came out last November and said, the only thing that I care about is championships, yes. and the only thing that I care about is winning, I was on my radio show defending it. I think mm -hmm. you were as yes, well I defending was. that and saying, hey, you know, he's given his seven years mm -hmm. here. Let him go win a championship. Right. But when he makes a heel turn, and says it's only about winning championships, but I want to go to the New York Knicks, mm -hmm. who are the most dysfunctional franchise right. this decade, who have been in existence for two years longer than the Pelicans and won less games this millennium than the Pelicans, and the Lakers, who are a dumpster fire right now. If those are your two preferred destinations, mm -hmm. and Rich Paul in this SI article is trying to spin that as, well, it's more yeah. about prestige and the ability to win championships, it just makes no yeah, sense, and they're right. making themselves look completely right. yeah, I, I would agree 100 percent i mean again uh, some of the things that were said in that article were ludicrous and and look it, it goes to show you it, it was about the market that the milwaukee throw in on that final on that four team that he wanted was a throw in right. because milwaukee was again playing very very well yeah. and looked like they had a chance to go to the nba finals uh you know so that was a throw in there uh, again it's all about the big market uh, and it's all really all about the Lakers because I think the New York Knicks are window dressing here as well. I don't, you know, would he go to the Knicks? Yes. Uh, could could there be another superstar or two that could be uh, that the Knicks could ultimately pull into into New York? It's New York. Yes, they could. But as you mentioned, two of the most dysfunctional franchises in the NBA right now, uh, maybe more dysfunctional than the Pelicans were under Dell Demps. And, 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 and I will say previous ownership, meaning Tom Benson. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with it. I wonder, does, does it seem, if you really take a step back here and, and look at what the Lakers are doing and Rob Palenka and Jeannie Buss on the top of it here are doing, um, and Kurt Rambis now, who is involved there with the Lakers, it seems like they're, they're playing checkers compared to everybody else's yes. check. I mean, anybody who's been around the NBA or covered it for a long time, you can see that the Lakers are desperate. They are flailing. Yes. They're trying all of these tactics, including very underhanded tactics, to get what they want, but they're playing against some of the best and brightest minds uh, in the NBA. They're not dealing with uh, the Phoenix Suns, right. and I'm not trying to take on more sure. shots of the Suns or the, you know, the Atlanta Hawks mm -hmm. or the Orlando Magic. I mean, this is David Griffin, and this is Danny Ainge. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two of the most respected voices in the NBA. Uh, you can see it, and I know, and this is where I will give the national media credit. You have some people now calling that stuff out. Woj, who, look, he's still being professional, but he's kind of clapping back at all these rumors coming out of L.A. saying, this doesn't make sense. Right. Like Danny Ainge isn't having this. Uh, David Griffin isn't having this. Um, we have some others doing the same thing. Uh, it's interesting to watch this dynamic play out. And the Lakers are flailing. And what and here's from their perspective what they're trying to do, Eric. They have another couple of years max, I believe, with LeBron James Agreed. in his prime to win a championship. Mm -hmm. They are desperate to try to make that happen. They need not one. They need two superstars mm -hmm. this summer to join him. Uh, in their mind, they're L.A., so they think, well, it's a done deal. They're going to get Anthony Davis, and they're going to get Kawhi Leonard there. They're going to win a title uh, the next couple of years. Uh, I don't think it's happening. I don't, I don't think it's happening. Well, again, LeBron's not the old LeBron, and he doesn't have to draw the old LeBron as well. And, again, if you're a superstar in your own right, and, and, and again, you're trying to set your own legacy, why do you go hook up with an aging LeBron who clearly is in charge of that franchise? Uh, Palinka, a, a, a former agent. Rich Paul obviously pulling some strings there, but you mentioned at the beginning of the show. No, we'll say it directly. LeBron James is running the Lakers right now, okay? He's telling, the, again, who they need to go get, go do this, go do that. And look, Rajon Rondo said as much when he talked about how, again, uh, Rich Paul really kind of blew up the season for the Lakers. Those young assets adored LBJ. They loved LeBron James. 
And, and they were devastated when they found out that ultimately, you know, they could be discarded for a, uh, a trade for Anthony Davis. We know what happened in Indiana with, again, uh, with Ingram at the, at the free throw line saying LeBron's going to trade you. That resonated throughout that locker room. And ultimately, again, that turned into to a really the, the, the nosedive that the Lakers were in. Well, LeBron is... Uh, Look, LeBron has a great legacy. He's going to be remembered as, if not the best basketball player Absolutely. of all time, one of the best basketball players of all time. But you're able to criticize those guys. They're still human. Mm-hmm. And one thing you can criticize LeBron on is that he has used leverage and and dirty tactics mm-hmm. and free agency in his advantage throughout his career to try to manipulate the NBA, manipulate the free agent mm-hmm. market, the trade True. market, other general managers, his own head coaches and owners into getting what he wants and putting himself in what he believes is the best position to win championships. The fact that he's only won uh, you know, the, the trio of titles mm-hmm. here in his career when he has had control basically over this whole market, I think says volumes about, well, right. maybe LeBron isn't this master... <laughs> No. You know, a team builder that everybody gives him credit for. Like, LeBron knows exactly how to build a championship team. Um, LeBron's lost uh, at least some of uh, that shine off his legacy. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of shine. We're going to forget about this in 20 years. Mm-hmm. But right now, he's lost a little bit of shine no, off that no, legacy. And look, I'm going to tell you what. I'll, I, will, I will blame the commissioners as well, both Stern and Adam Silver. Basically, what he's done is, is again, tampering. Okay? And, uh, you know, call what you want. Players can't tamper. When a player is basically the de facto general manager of, of a franchise, whether that be Cleveland, whether that be with Miami, even though, again, we know Pat Riley was clearly in charge there, but again, LeBron got his way. Um, but but and especially now with the Lakers, you're in a situation where as a commissioner, you need to step up. And, they ha- and, he, and neither commissioner, and as much as Stern was a strong commissioner, when, when maybe Adam Silver's not as strong, neither have stepped up there. Let's talk about the Boston Celtics. Because... Uh, as we mentioned, uh, Kyrie Irving has changed agencies now. He's with the Rock Agency. He's fired his longtime agent. There are rumors, and again, the season of misinformation, out of Boston that he may be interested in, in possibly, again, um, re-signing long-term with Boston now that it may look like Kevin Durant may opt into that deal. Uh, he's got a $31 million opt-in with the Golden State Warriors for next season, rehab, and then going to free agency the following year. Um, if that happens, all along we heard Kyrie and Anthony Davis. Uh, and also, when you look at the problems they had within that locker room during the year, we had a lot of those young stars that played the season before, were very had prominent roles in their, in their playoff run, and then all of a sudden those roles diminished when Gordon Hayward came back, when Kyrie Irving came back, and then there was this infighting and, and, and just some malcontents in that locker room. It's a win-win from Danny Ainge's standpoint. If Danny Ainge has got to package some of these young guys to move on, to move to get Anthony Davis, well, he gets Davis. As you mentioned a little bit earlier, they're getting rid of some of these uh, these contracts that are about to expire. That are going to these guys are going to be signing big deals. But then you're in a situation where you get where Boston gets what they wanted already, which was Irving and and and, and Davis on the same team. And then how does Anthony Davis walk away from that? Well, I don't know. And we do have his dad on record saying he right. can play in Boston. That was right. last month. Remember, sure. now his dad's also flip-flopped here a little bit on where he'll actually play or not want to play. But the last thing his dad said is All calculated. AD, right. It all calculated, but his dad yeah. did say that he would go play in Boston. Um, uh, Boston now is at a little bit of a crossroads mm-hmm. with this young roster that Danny Ainge uh, has built. Um, what's happened the last couple of years with Paul George going to Oklahoma City being traded and then re-signing and then Kawhi Leonard's mm-hmm. one year in a player deal getting Toronto here with one one game mm-hmm. it's happening later tonight we'll see if they can win a championship helps the, the Pelicans immensely in this mm-hmm. Eric I think five years ago uh, the Pelicans would have been looking at a very diminished return for Anthony yes. Davis on a one year rent a deal True. but now that Oklahoma City we had the entire country uh, it was AD to a little lesser extent mm-hmm. and I don't know if you remember this with Paul George and went to Oklahoma City and the entire country was sure was positive Positive yes. that Paul George was going to go to L.A. and team up with LeBron James because it's the Lakers, mm-hmm. it's the big market, and Paul George wanted to get there and win championships. Paul George embraced that small market, saw the fans loved and adored him, saw that they could be very competitive and even championship level or you know sub-championship yes. level competitive there, and re-signed. And I think if you're making me a betting man here, I think Kawhi Leonard's going to do the same thing yeah. in Toronto. Why wouldn't Kawhi right. Leonard do the same thing? That, that market makes well, way too much sense. He's for free from now on, right? Yeah. <laughs> and again, every it's, place it's, he goes now has his sticker on, 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 the, on the window. So he eats for free. He can he can uh, stay in a, in a luxurious apartment if he'd like for free. I mean, they're giving him yeah. uh, anything he wants to be able to stay in Toronto. But to your point, I agree. I think there's a better chance of him re-signing with Toronto than going to the Los Angeles. Well, and, and if Anthony Davis is traded anywhere but Los Angeles, I think that is almost a done deal because if AD is traded to L.A. and Kawhi sees mm-hmm. Anthony Davis and LeBron 
in LA, which he's from the LA area, they right. have the greater LA area there, then I think you could see a case where Kawhi does go back mm -hmm. to LA. But if Kawhi sees kind of the spreading out of talent, mm -hmm. uh, if he sees that well, LeBron doesn't have this other superstar there, I'd be going and I'd be I'd be playing with LeBron and all mm -hmm. these you know the guys that didn't make the playoffs last year, or I could stay here mm -hmm. where we either won a championship or came within one uh, you know one season of winning a championship. Kawhi's going to stay there. So this goes back to Boston. Boston now is hearing from everybody mm -hmm. across the league. Don't take the chance on AD. He's a one-year rent-a-player mm -hmm. deal. He didn't make the finals the last couple of years without Anthony Davis. How much is he really going to help you? Uh, from what we've heard, Danny Age believes that Anthony Davis can be a championship piece next year. And even on a deal, a one-year deal, if you're trading away multiple first-round picks, something like Tatum and Brown or whoever yes. that is that he decides, if you win a championship in Boston, nobody up in Boston is going to care about what you gave away for Anthony Davis. If you win a championship, even if it's just one year, yes. that's worth it. Now you have the capital where you have uh, the political capital where, well, it's just going to be Lanyap if he actually resigns mm -hmm. here. Uh, I still think, I believe, and heck, we could get off the air here and the trade could right. break, but right now I still believe that the Boston Celtics – are, are the place that Anthony Davis is going to end up. I think it's oh, probably like a 45% a Boston, 35% right. LA, and yeah. you know, maybe 20% uh, everybody else. I 100% agree with you, by yeah. the way. Um, all right, Jason Tatum's got to be in the deal, okay, uh, if you're making a deal with Boston. Uh, I like Brown and Smart, okay? Now, again, you don't, I don't know if he's willing to give up Brown and Smart. Also, that Memphis pick, which is lottery protected next season, but the following season is unprotected. Uh, in the lottery. And of course, I've had some people say, well, Memphis may be pretty good by that time. Uh, Memphis is not going to be a playoff team within two seasons. They are rebuilding as well. Uh, you know, they just lost their big center today. It's going, it's going to free agency. So uh, what do you think that deal looks like ultimately if it's made? Well, I think it's going to be probably two first round picks, including the Memphis mm -hmm. deal in a couple of years that you just mentioned. It's got to be Jason Tatum. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been sources, and I think uh, Fletcher was the one to report yes, this, that, that David Griffin covets Jason Tatum more than any player in the NBA in this Anthony Davis trade. I think it's going to be Tatum. I think it's going to be probably Brown, and you're talking about a couple of first-round picks. Now, here's where the three-way deal gets interesting also. Let's say that uh, uh, the Boston Celtics don't want to send that second piece along with Jason Tatum other than draft picks. Well, then you can use Anthony Davis, send him there, and you can involve a third team to get the Pelicans back either a, a pick mm -hmm. or a, a young developing player uh, soon. I also want to, in this three-way deal, I want to mention, I've heard this a lot today, and I Go tweeted ahead. it out. Um, I've heard so much about Bradley Beal. That's well, where uh, I was going uh, next. Yeah, Please take it. So much with Bradley Beal, and I just want to throw a little bit of cold water on this. Not saying that it's not a possibility that Bradley Beal mm -hmm. could be involved here in a three-way deal with Los Angeles Lakers. Bradley Beal's a fantastic player. Mm -hmm. He's got two years left on his deal. Yes. He's going to be a super max guy mm -hmm. uh, coming up. He's, yeah. he's one of the best shooting guards in the league. I get True. that. But you only have two years of team control mm -hmm. if you were to trade for Bradley Beal. Mm -hmm. He is uh, going on 26 years old. So when Zion Williamson, when he's up for that first contract and really the Pelicans by that mm -hmm. time and four years down the road, uh, they should be a championship level you contender with Zion mm -hmm. in a handful of years. Well, Bradley Beal probably wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And all these people who assume that Bradley Beal is, it's a sure thing that when right. he's traded here, he's going to resign with the Pelicans. Have people paid attention to unrestricted free agents, max right. level free agents sure. in this franchise? Right. I get the, the optimism that comes with David Griffin. Right. I've been sucked up, up into it too. Right. But you cannot tell me that you are certain that what is a rent -a player, right. a two year rent -a player, in Bradley Beal is worth. Anthony Davis? Like, that's the centerpiece of an Anthony Davis trade. I firmly believe, I firmly believe with what I've heard from David Griffin directly mm -hmm. and what I've heard coming from sources outside of the Pelicans organization, that David Griffin would not want Bradley Beal as the centerpiece of this because he wants multiple young stars, or what he thinks are stars, right. multiple young picks that are all mm -hmm. around Zion's age so they can build together. Maybe with a guy mm -hmm. like Drew Holiday mm -hmm. to groom them, but there's no way you trade for two years of Bradley Beal when it's not going to matter. They're not competing for titles here the next couple of years, Eric, right. when you right. have Bradley Beal under contract. And to your point, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, you can sign them to a rookie max deal coming up. You've got them on their second deal yep. if ultimately they're going to sign. Bradley Beal, you will not. Bradley Beal has an opportunity to be unrestricted, can move anywhere he wants. So right now you'll have those guys for two years, but you have those guys for two years with a possibility of going a little bit longer. I mean, it's so, that is so massive. I think when people just see, you, you see Bradley Beal, mm -hmm. you see the outstanding shooting, the, you know, the, 
Um, the 25 points a game that he's scoring, excellent three-point shooter, pretty good leader in the locker room, although there's some, there's some stuff there that maybe we should talk about. Uh, they see that. They don't see the contract situation right. like you just said, and the NBA is weird. Uh, what happens with the contracts is, uh, for everybody out there, you've got uh, four years on your initial deal, mm -hmm. and then that four years turns into a restricted free agency, which means the team that drafted you has a chance to match any deal across the NBA. Basically, with these stars, they're going to get that second contract. Yes. This is another four-year deal. Because that, that team can play them any more. The, the home team can play them any more, more than any other club out there. That's that's correct. So you get what amounts to eight years of team control yes. with any rookie draft pick. Bradley Beal has two, two years left. As opposed two to two years left. Right. As opposed to six years. I, I will tell you this. I, I just said that mm -hmm. I'm not. I, Lonzo would scare me in New mm -hmm. Orleans. I'll tell you this. Uh, that Lakers deal that I mentioned, mm -hmm. the Lakers deal of Brandon Ingram mm -hmm. and Lonzo Ball right. and the fourth round pick, mm -hmm. that sounds a lot better to me than something like Bradley Beal and right. the fourth round pick. All those guys again under their first contract. Yeah. Uh, so you, again, you. As you mentioned, you continue to hold that control. And I think it's a, that is a, a great point. And one of the things that I'm, I'm sure David Griffin is looking at, okay? I, I'm a little bit leery of Bradley Beal as well, okay? Because as I mentioned, you're talking about almost $50 million over the next two years. Uh, and then at that point, you're going to have to ante up. Are you willing to do that? You know, where are you going to be? With that said, before we go to break, any other teams out there that may be sneaking in at the last minute that may say, you know what, we're one player away, there's not enough max, max players from, for the max slots that are out there, we're going to take a chance here. Uh, not that what I've heard, but I have heard from multiple people saying, watch out for the Dallas Mavericks, okay. possibly getting involved in a three-way deal here. Anthony Davis wouldn't end up in Dallas. Uh, from everything that I've heard and what people have told me, it's the Lakers, it's the Celtics, it's the Knicks, maybe outside chance for Brooklyn. But three-way deals, you got teams like the Wizards, you got teams like um, the Dallas Mavericks mm -hmm. that can also get involved here. But I think we are down to really what, what is a big three with maybe you could throw on Brooklyn there um, yeah. as a fourth option, although Brooklyn has diminished here the last... One interesting thing about the Brooklyn deal is like Jay Z owns the Rock um, um, uh, agency. Uh, Kyrie just signed with uh, the Rock agency. Some have speculated that that opens the door for him to go to Brooklyn. Again, some of us have said that opens the door for him to stay in Boston. It'll be interesting to see that, that, how that kind of plays out. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting uh, with, with Kyrie Irving specifically. We right. just we just don't know no, have no idea. where he's going to end right. up. He's that domino. There was. Kevin Durant, Kawhi, and Kyrie. Yes. Kevin Durant, I'm with you. I, I think you mentioned that you believe that he's going to read that. He's uh, going to opt in. He's going to opt in. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer here. You right. opt in, and then oh, you might have a chance to get back to the team that, that we won all these championships yes. with next year. Really sad what happened to Kevin Durant. But uh, uh, now you just have the Kyrie, you got mm -hmm. Kawhi, and you got Anthony Davis. You're right. the three big pieces. Uh, I do kind of expect two of them to end up together somewhere, whether that's Anthony Davis and Kawhi in L.A., mm -hmm. whether that's Kyrie and Anthony Davis in Boston, or Kyrie and Anthony Davis with right. New York, something like that. Yeah, and you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen with Clay Thompson uh, in free agency as well. Overshadowed at Golden State. Uh, again, uh, I think the Golden State fans know, know who he's worth, but nationwide, it's about, it's about Curry, it's about Durant. Uh, you know, he kind of gets lost in, in, in the wash here. You know, does, uh, after he's won multiple rings, is he ready to still go, kind of break out on his own and be his own guy? You know, maybe, maybe hooking up with another team, with another star. Let me just see what he does there. Before we get done with basketball, game six tonight at Oracle, last game in the history of, of, of that, um, uh, that arena. Uh, Toronto, Golden State, what do you think happens? Uh, it's the Oracle. It's the last game. Uh, what are they, like two-point favorites, I think, mm -hmm. or something like that? Uh, when, they, when I came into the studio here, I think Golden State gets it done tonight. I think it goes back to Toronto for Game 7, which is what everybody wants right. to see. This is a fantastic really series, is. by the way. Considering, again, Golden State limping into this uh, series, the injuries they've had to have, Looney coming off, off, off the, uh, uh, the, the, really the, the, the medical cart, uh, you got a situation with Durant, obviously, trying to play through his injury. Uh, we know the, the ruptured Achilles tendon. Everybody feels bad about that. And then, again, Clay Thompson also injured. And, oh, by the way, the awakening of the Toronto Raptors, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, look, they're, they're a good team. Kawhi has lifted that team and put them on his shoulders, something Anthony Davis never did here in New Orleans. No, and um, I will say this about the Golden State Warriors. If, and it's still a big if, right. they got to win two in a row here. If they come back and win this championship, Eric, this is going to be one of the greatest – championship runs in NBA history, period, because yeah. of all the injuries all the that injuries. you just said and yeah. everything behind the scenes with Golden State and Clay maybe leaving and mm -hmm. KD maybe leaving mm -hmm. and all this. Uh, it's 
you want you hate on Golden State. I understand why. Uh, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about sure. the other audience right. here. You, you hate seeing them winning all the time. You hate dynasties. Uh, just enjoy what you're seeing here. It's incredible to watch. Well, well Seth, look at their roster and look where they're who they're playing now. You know, when you get past the, the the stars, the max guys on that team, you know, some of the guys are now having to contribute. Yeah. You know, McKee and others. I mean, you look at it, they're going, who are these guys? Yeah, who, I know, mean, they brought Cook? Andrew Bogut, you right. know, out, out yeah, of the Bogut graveyard. Bogut, they pulled him out of mothballs. Right. You know, <laughs> I will say this. For Golden State to, to win, Boogie Cousins has got to play at, at, at a high level, and he's been so inconsistent since the injury. I'd have interesting to see again how he plays going forward. Look, he had a bad fourth quarter. Up until that, he thought he really, really played well. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll be one of the keys going forward if Golden State's going to win this. Yeah, that was a bad sequence it really for Boogie. Was. He had the offensive interference, uh, the goal 10, yes. and then you had the... The, the illegal screen, which everybody right. tells me, if that was anybody no. but Boogie, it would have been called. It was a no. body block, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. It's something you see on uh, the Saints on Sunday, yeah, yeah. not on the NBA. All right, we'll take a break. We come back. We'll talk NCAA basketball investigations. Uh, both Seth and I have talked about a lot on this, on, on, on this program the last time he was here, on both of our radio shows. Uh, what does this mean for LSU? We'll get into that. We'll talk a little Saints football, and we'll try to get to some LSU baseball as well. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports, Seth Dunlap, WWL Radio. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Don't go anywhere. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration has been family-owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy-efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi Ductless AC Units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator, and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration, providing comfort for life. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the Best of Food Network's diners, drive-ins, and dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Tonight, Seth Dunlap of WWL Radio is our guest. All right, it was announced uh, yesterday, CBSSports.com did an interview um, with, uh, with one of the uh, high-ranking officers uh, with, within the NCAA, the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Stan Wilcox, in which he says at least six Division I men's basketball programs will re receive not notifications of level one violations of the NCAA uh, this summer. Uh, of course, we know level one violations uh, could uh, carry punishments of uh, scholarship reductions, postseason bans, show cause orders against coaches. Also, we know that now coaches are being held responsible and accountable now for any type of NCAA uh, violations. Uh, there have been some schools that have been mentioned in the past. Uh, Kansas, Arizona, Louisville are under an NCAA investigation. Also, Oklahoma State, USC, Auburn, Louisiana State University. Um, he goes on to talk about, again, uh, the number of cases that were listed in the trial in the Southern District of New York. But he also goes to talk about some of the top coaches that were mentioned in that trial and, again, about the, of the violation of the NCAA rules. Now, one of the things that, that, that got me out of this article is, again, uh, the fact that the NCAA is not going to get the, the, uh, the information or, or the investigation from the federal government. They're not going to turn that over. What happened in the Southern District of, um, of New York with the Dawkins Code trial is under seal, so they won't have that. They don't have access to the wiretaps, but they did have investigators that were sitting in the courtroom on a daily basis taking notes. Uh, they also talked about the fact that things have changed since the, since the Rice Commission, where the NCAA now uh, has true investigators, uh, more than the six or seven they used to have to cover the entire NCAA. It is outside of the NCAA now, so you've got what ex-FBI, ex-detectives now that are involved in this, that are doing investigations. And again, they this is uncharted territory in terms of you know how the punishments will be levied going down down, down the road here. Before we get into the LSU situation, 
Just your thoughts on what was reported within the last 24 hours. Oh, I mean, Eric, this was the earthquake that we had been waiting for since this was announced two years ago. We been waiting two full years when the FBI kind of said, hey, this is the earthquake that's coming to college basketball. Right. And they were kind of boasting that things are going to happen here. The college basketball world pushed back. A lot of fans uh, of specific programs pushed back and said, well, you know, come on, the, the NCAA isn't going to do anything about this. And frankly, in my own cynicism and my pessimism, I kind of wondered, uh, is Mark Emmert and the NCAA really going to take this seriously or do do they care about uh, you know the perception of the sport so much that they're going to brush this under the table? We have never seen anything like this happen in major college sports before. Let's take the LSU side out of this. I don't from this conversation, regardless of whether LSU is involved or not. Right. What we know now, this isn't a source. This isn't mm -hmm. hyperbole. This is Stan Wilcox, a representative from the NCAA, telling us yes. that there is indeed six notifications of level one violations coming. Some of them to major programs mm -hmm. within the next month or so. Level one violations, and, and yes. I just want to emphasize this Please again. Do. That is multi-year postseason bans. This is scholarship productions. This is coach bans or show cause. Uh, this is major stuff that we're going to see to at least six programs. Now, what Stan Wilcox is also on the record in there saying is that it's not just the six. They only have so many investigators, right? Yes. They're not the FBI. They don't right. have unlimited resources. Well, take some time. They got these six done. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to their next batch. Mm -hmm. We're going to see another next batch of this one come, whether that's level one or level two mm -hmm. violations. And then come August 1, and you referenced this as well, the Condoleezza Rice Commission on College Basketball uh, was something that they created uh, when this first broke to study what's wrong with the sport and give Mark Emmert and the NCAA ideas. Uh, didn't come up with a lot, admittedly. Right. One thing they did come up with was an independent panel that will be, go into effect on August 1st yes. that will uh, look at the information and they'll also hand out penalties um, through the NCAA to these schools. So from an LSU perspective now, if they're not in this first batch, that doesn't mean they're out of the woods. Mm -hmm. If they're not in the second batch of these that's coming, doesn't mean they're out mm -hmm. of the woods. If it gets to August 1st, watch out. If you're LSU, you do not want to be one of the programs scrutinized by that new commission because they're going to want to make a statement. That yes. commission will, and that panel Absolutely. will rather, that they take this seriously and the penalties that they impose mm -hmm. are serious as well. Okay. If I'm LSU, I'm kind of cleaning my own house here, and I'm hoping if anything comes, it comes now before that commission. And again, anybody who thought this was just going to blow over, anybody who thought that just because Will Wade didn't have to testify, uh, he got out of that subpoena, uh, that it was going to blow over just because he was reinstated, I said for a long time, folks, uh, that's not how this stuff works. Uh, reckoning day is coming. Right. Let's, let's, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because, again, I'm... I'm one that, like you have said, I didn't think Will Wade would coach another, another, another second at LSU. It looks as though he's going to be on the bench next year. All right, first of all, uh, when you talk about Will Wade, he's already uh, uh, changed the terms of his contract. Level one, level two violations. They can, they can uh, fire him for cause. He loses his $10 million contract. He has no retribution on, on the school. The question is, what does the NCAA have on LSU at this point? Okay, we know that Book Richardson said uh, on, an, on, on an FBI wiretap, that uh, Wade told him that there was a $300,000 payment for Nas Reed. Uh, both Nas Reed and Will Wade have denied that ever happening. Uh, there was no paper trail from what we know as of right now on Reed or, or Wade. Uh, there were also, again, other leaks as far as the Yahoo uh, situation with the, with the uh, Code and Dawkins uh, trial, uh, with the uh, strong blank offer to Javante Smart, again, NCAA, along with, uh, with LSU, sat down. Uh, they, they did a, a, a quick investigation of Javante Smart, his mother, the handler, the AU coach, and also, again, through that, Will Wade as well. Those, both Will Wade and Javante Smart, both reinstated. Okay, so the, 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 some will say, wait a minute, where's the smoking gun here? If you're, if you're not going to be able to take excerpts from wiretaps and you need, you need hard evidence to go after these schools, where is the smoking gun for LSU and Will Wade right now? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't have it. Right. No, I know. <laughs> no, I know. I know, I know what you're saying. Devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I don't have it. What I will say is okay. you could apply that exact same thing to every program across okay. the country. Right? You could say that about Sean Miller in right. Arizona. Right. There's no smoking gun mm -hmm. there. Uh, Kansas and Bill Self. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is, regardless of no smoking gun mm -hmm. that we know about here, except maybe Auburn with their coach and maybe Louisville because they mm -hmm. had, so those are probably the mm -hmm. two that are sure. front and center. Outside of that, there's not six programs with a smoking gun. So the NCAA knows enough where they're ready to impose penalties here, and it's coming. 
right? And also, uh, for the people who push back, and I've gotten on my social media, well, you can't just go off the Yahoo reports and the hearsay. I agree with that from an NCAA perspective. Right. You can't suspend or fire Will Wade or, or penalize True. a program just because something was reported in Yahoo and you don't know about it. But what we do know is, back in October, I think people forget this, back in October, there was a wiretap of a transcript that was read aloud in federal court. When reporters were there and journalists were there and these NCAA right. investigators were there, when uh, uh, Will Wade was on the phone with Christian Dawkins yes. talking about an international player mm -hmm. and offers to get him. The kid that went to, to Florida State. Exactly. It offers to get him to come to mm -hmm. uh, LSU. Just that in itself, mm -hmm. and I, now I'm speculating a little bit, just that in itself, remember that's, that's opens evidence. Opens the door. Opens the door to this where the NCAA could have, and I'm assuming will mm -hmm. investigate this. Don't know what they'll find, but they will investigate this. Right. I am not saying, and I maintain this throughout the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks, uh, and certainly since yesterday in this broke. I am not saying that I know that LSU is going to be implicated mm -hmm. here. What I do know is that they are one of about 10 programs mm -hmm. who are the most implicated in this. And again, LSU fans and Eric, I, I know what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. If LSU is not in this first six batch, you're going to have people celebrating Baton Rouge saying, see, nothing's wrong. And I'm going to say, hold on. We have Stan Wilcox on record again right. saying it's six. And right now, they've already gotten these six ready. Right now, as we speak, they are investigating a whole other batch of these. Right. What they expect, Stan Wilcox expects more uh, notifications of violation to come. This is massive news across the NCAA. I would agree. One of the things that was talked about uh, by, by uh, Stan Wilcox was eligibility issues. Uh, the question would be, and I would think it would be, eligibility, eligibility issues would be inducements to players to play at your university. Yeah. That would be an eligibility issue. Am I right or wrong? No, I mean, that's absolutely right. right. And, and the, the biggest one you have, and Kansas is all tied up in this, mm -hmm. you have uh, Kansas reportedly, and this was in federal trial. Mm -hmm. This is, I believe, close. We don't know. I wonder right. if the NCAA investigators know that Zion Williamson was offered money and yes. his dad was offered a job at yes. Kansas. Kansas did not sign him. Instead, he goes to Duke. Now, you can make your own uh, you know, uh, hyperboles and hypotheses mm -hmm. about what happened to Duke, but Kansas is caught up in this big time, and they already had another player, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, was uh, um, already caught up in this. So yeah. there, there's... There's so many uh, you know, entrails splayed right. out across the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's crazy. Now, uh, again, from my perspective, and, I, and I'm, I'm on record here, I'm on record on the radio show, in my opinion, Will Wade did cheat, okay? Now, the question is, does the NCAA have the evidence to be able to prove Will Wade cheated? Yeah, I don't know that. And, and I will say, and this is where the LSU fans are absolutely right, Will Wade isn't the only bad actor. No, he's not. If there are way too many of these across college basketball. John Beeline at Michigan, mm -hmm. Eric, one of the guys who I, I have said on my program is clean. Yeah. He has been a crusader against this. He just quit college basketball. Right. Went to NBA. He went to the NBA in one yeah. of the most cush gigs in college mm -hmm. basketball program that he had competing for national mm -hmm. titles every single year. Mm -hmm. And he says, enough, enough. I, I'm tired of this. I don't, I don't want to play in this, this dirty mud anymore. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's doing it. There are clean right. programs. Tony Bennett at mm -hmm. Virginia, Jay Wright at Villanova, Mark mm -hmm. Few at Gonzaga. Uh, but just because you are doing it while other people are doing some nefarious things doesn't absolve you of this and will wade certainly looks like he got his hand caught in the cookie jar here's the deal it, it doesn't it's not going to make a dent in anything unless blue bloods are involved if they go after and, and they put um violations on blue bloods well then at that point you could say the ncw is serious if they go after the second tier programs and that's all they do, well, then you could say they're protecting the sport. Well, and that's where I, I do get a little concerned, and I hope that Stan Wilcox is right here, that they're going after, it sounded like, high-level program. Right. When you but talk Kansas, just, Louisville, I mean, come but on. But if he board. goes after Auburn, if, right. not he, but they go after Auburn, uh, Oklahoma State, right. Virginia Tech, and then LSU, right. and leave Kansas and Arizona and right. all these other programs, right. yeah, I'm, I'm going to be sitting here on the air going, what in the world's going on right. here? Right, right. That, that's the thing. If they go after the Blue Bloods, well, then you know they're really serious. If they don't, because, they, again, they, they mean the college basketball, well, then at that point, you know it's just lip service. All right, let's shift, let's shift to the Saints. It's going to be a quick one, folks, because it's minicamp. And, and believe me, I know fans might get caught up in it, but there's really not a lot to talk about. Um, first of all, how many spots do you think are open on this team? You know, I'm thinking eight. You know, I think ten's high. You know, maybe five to eight at the end of the day. I mean, there's not a lot of spots open on this team that you could say, hey, the rugby player has a really good chance of making the team. No. You know, right now you've got bona fide players that, 
you know, uh, that have played on other NFL teams, they're going to be, be in a fight for a roster. Some of those guys that were on this team last year are going to be in a fight for a roster. But there's, there's not a lot of spots available, in my opinion, on this team. No, there are not. I would say probably a handful, right. legitimately yeah. a handful of spots. You're always going to have injuries in training camp and, mm -hmm. and going forward, unfortunately. It's, it's NFL football. Um, that's a good problem to have, though, Eric. Yes. When you've got 90 guys plus here competing for essentially uh, mm -hmm. uh, what are five spots within the guys so it's not 90 you know you may have 50 guys competing for what what right. essentially are five spots here right. uh, maybe less than that with the rookies that are here mm -hmm. it's a great problem to yes, have it is. it's an absolutely great problem to have I, I do wonder about the cornerback spots mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Robinson has looked good out at mm -hmm. camp that's one of the things that we've heard uh, also the wide receivers have looked mm -hmm. uh, pretty good including a Traquan Smith and also the quarterback play out there mm -hmm. and uh, Drew wasn't here the first two days mm -hmm. rave reviews about Teddy Bridgewater yes. Rave reviews. This is weird. Wait, rave reviews about JT Barrett. Yeah. Saying okay. he's had his best couple of days of practice right. ever. Well, well nobody's same. hitting anybody, though. But yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Nobody's hitting anybody. Right. But that's what we get. Yeah, right? right. And I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, full disclosure, this is uh, my least favorite time of the it NFL season too. because unless you are coaching these guys and watching film with them yes. and teaching them and seeing the technique, right. you're not really going right. to gain much out no, of this. But, but again, you can see if they're, they're picking up the system, yeah. if, they're, do, if they're, uh, they're, they're taking what they've learned in the classroom, they're bringing it to the practice field, they're, they're completing their assignments. Uh, you can look at pure athleticism, okay, in, in terms of, especially when you talk about wide receivers, defensive backs, etc. But as far as, again, in the trenches, it's a waste of time. You're not, you, you know, but it'll be interesting to see, again, Camaraderie is also a big part of what you're doing right now mm -hmm. when, when you're building a team. You really build the camaraderie and the spirit of the team in off-season workouts and also uh, in, in minicamp as well. Well, to that point, there's a little bit of void in the locker room because of Mark Ingram. This so who's going to step in that? Be, right? Might be Alvin Kamara. We don't know. Might yeah. be Michael Thomas. He's certainly become more of a leader in that locker room now. Uh, good to have Cam Jordan re-sign. That's one of the things that came back here. Why don't you talk about game. it? Because that was going to be my next point. Uh, three years, $53 million deal, $42 million of that guaranteed. He goes from, what is it, 19th or, or 20th highest paid defensive end to the fourth highest. He's now under contract with the Saints for the next five years. Uh, and, and again, mu first of all, much deserved. No, oh, much deserved. Are you kidding me? Yes, this is a guy who was underpaid, like you just right. said. One of the most underpaid players in the entire NFL. Uh, he's one of, I think, the two or three best two-way defensive ends, run stopping and pass running in the league. Mm -hmm. uh, this will get him through Almost his entire career puts him into his mid-30s. Uh, he wants to be uh, a New Orleans Saint for life. It sounded like that. And uh, finally, ink is to that deal. Now, guess who's up next? Yeah, and look, he, Peyton's talked about it, which really shocked me I when did. I heard the cut. And once you go ahead, you were there. You saw you heard him talking about it. I did. I picked up on it. So unsolicited. We went from talking about the Cameron Jordan in a press conference with Sean Payton. Then we, somebody asked a question about Michael Thomas looks really good out on the field as he turned yeah. into a leader in the locker room. And unsolicited, Sean Payton said that he was sure that Michael Thomas is going to be the next guy to get a deal done with the Saints. Now, Sean is savvy, right? Mm -hmm. And he does it. This is why it caught my eye. He mm -hmm. does not say stuff Never. like that in the camp. Ever. And you could see him instantly kind of walk back and say, well, I will, you know, Mickey's going to be negotiating that deal and he'll be the next guy. Right. I don't get involved in that. We'll see what happen but that was kind of Sean saying that I want this guy in a Saints mm -hmm. uniform I am sure that we're going to make sure that I have this guy as a weapon on my team as long as I'm here I, I as for as much as I've been skeptical about the Saints actually paying Michael Thomas 20 million dollars a year making him the highest paid receiver that was the first time that I really thought oh boy if Sean's saying this mm -hmm. even if it's he didn't really mean to say it if he's saying that in a public forum I think that leads you to believe the Saints are going to get something done. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. You know, there's a lot of conjecture over the $8 million left under the cap, which is unheard of in the New Orleans Saints, right? right. Yeah. Okay, well, Gerald McCoy was on the market. Go get McCoy. He signs for $4 million guaranteed with the Carolina Panthers. Uh, $4 million he can get in incentives and bonuses. He turns down $8 million guaranteed from the Baltimore Ravens. And everybody was saying he wants to stay in the NFC South. Go get McCoy. Well, you can't get McCoy if you're underpaying Cam Jordan. And, oh, by the way, you've got to pay uh, uh, Michael Thomas. And, again, maybe utilizing this, what's left of this cap to try to get those deals done before you get to next season. Well, remember, the cap rolls over, too. Right. So let's say they, they don't spend that $8 million. Mm -hmm. That'll be $8 million more you have next exactly. year, which some franchises like New England's great at this. Baltimore, Seattle's right. always great at this and utilizing that, you know, the rollover year. All right. Let's go to the phone lines. Somebody I know that knows basketball very, very well. Ned is in Metairie. Ned, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. How you doing, Ned? Hey, guys. I want to ask Seth, a, ask Seth one quick question. Go ahead. The one thing that nobody's discussing in all of these possibilities with Pelicans and David Griffin, and I guarantee you David Griffin is not talking about it out loud, 
the Pelicans cannot come out of all these deals that are forthcoming without a big man. We don't have a big man. Everybody that's being talked about is either a guard or, or a forward. And I have to think that any deal that's made, there has to be a legitimate big man coming from somewhere to this basketball team. And I'll hang up and listen. Thank you, Ned. Uh, here's what I would say to that. First of all, I'm a big guy, right? So I'm, I'm pro team big man. You got any yeah. eligibility left? Can right, you? no, no eligibility <laughs> left. They wouldn't want me anyways. Here's what I say, though, uh, uh, Ned, is that this is the new age NBA. This is the positionless NBA. And look what's going on right now over in Golden State. You have a 6'7 Draymond Green playing the five. You got Klay Thompson and Steph Curry and Andre Iguodala. And unless they bring Boogie out there, they're all 6'8 and under. Uh, the Pelicans will have Zion, who's 6'7. They've got some size still here. I don't necessarily think they got to have that big seven footer on the inside. You know David Griffin's going to want to have some size at least to bring off the bench, but I don't know if that's, that has to be a centerpiece. Or maybe a guy like R.J. Barrett. If they work with the Knicks to get that third overall pick, they can bring uh, R.J. Barrett here, who has some size to go along with Zion. But this is, and, and look, I'm an old school guy, like I just said. Mm -hmm. I'm back when you had the five and you had the center scoring 20 points a game and grabbing mm -hmm. 15 rebounds, but that's just not the NBA anymore, and I think David Griffin realizes you that. You mean like the great legacy of the centers that the Los Angeles Lakers had that Rich Paul talked about? <laughs> right. From Mike to Chamberlain to uh, Jabbar and yeah. how Anthony Davis as a center needs to join the Los Angeles Lakers? He's not Lakers. a center. He's not a center. No, <laughs> okay, no he's, yeah, not. he's not a center. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk LSU baseball with the time we have left. Uh, two in barbecue against Florida State, unheard of uh, when, it, when it comes to LSU. Look, I, I think if you want to fault Maneri, you can say his team got beat because they were undisciplined. Undisciplined on the base pass, undisciplined when it, when it came, when it came uh, in the batter's box. Uh, I thought the starting pitching let them down as well. Uh, you know, they had, they, had, they had a lot of problems that, that were unforced errors, in, in, in my opinion. Your thoughts on the series? Yeah, there was... Uh... And it's really, I walk a fine line, and you know this, we walk a fine line with these amateur college athletes. You don't want to be too critical of them, but you've got to point out the truth here, and that was just way too many mistakes on the base running pass. I mean, you had Saul Garza uh, missing second base, a mistake that, that I haven't seen in decades, mm -hmm. I would probably say, especially in, in that level of, of baseball in college or the pros. And then you had Saul, who's dealing with an injury. Um, he had that, uh, that pass ball. I think it was ruled a wild pitch. Let's be honest. That was a, that was a pass ball so. that allowed uh, Florida State uh, to score there or get the runner to second that mm -hmm. eventually scored there. Uh, I'm not trying to pick on Saul. Uh, you had uh, Zach Watson, mm -hmm. although Paul Maneri says it wasn't a, a mistake because he was just being aggressive. But if you step back from all this, this is what I thought was so interesting, and I wrote about it. In Baton Rouge this weekend, you had fans lining up for a head coach, yes. wanting autographs, taking pictures, mm -hmm. taking selfies, adoring him. Right. Not Paul Maneri, right. a, guy right. named, and a guy named Mike Martin right. from Florida State who deserves it. He Absolutely. deserves it. Been Absolutely. there for 40 years, all-time winning as coach in the NCAA. Here's the thing. Mike Martin has never won an NCAA title. Right. And he hasn't even been to the College World Series final since 1999. Yes before Skip Burtman won that last title. Mm -hmm. Paul Maneri has been to the College World Series final two times mm -hmm. in the last mm -hmm. decade, been to, the, to Omaha five different times. Mm -hmm. Folks, Paul Maneri is the right guy for this job. Thank is you. he perfect? No. But you will rue the day that Paul Maneri is no longer there because I think uh, he's one of the handful of, of great coaches in the NCAA. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, it, it blows my mind, okay, that LSU fans who, are, again, are baseball savvy, yeah. okay, that they're willing to run him out of town. You know, because my, my answer to that always is, who are you going to get? Let me give you an analogy here. Uh, Duke basketball. Right. Duke basketball. If I said, how many times has Duke made the Final Four? Which is, you know, kind of analogous right. to, uh, you know, the final series uh, in college baseball in the last 15 years. How many times have they made uh, the NCAA Final Four? One time in the last 15 years. One time? Right. Well, Do you see anybody over they, in they Duke? They're picking in Coach Cameron? K over there? Right. No. <laughs> no. They understand that this is now the new age of right. college athletics, that right. parity reigns supreme. Pulmonary is dealing with that. LSU is getting used to that. They'll be fine. They've got to reevaluate how they handle the pitchers. They've got to reevaluate a little bit how they recruit, especially left handed yes. pitching, Agreed. but they'll be okay. Agreed. And again, Skip Burton spoiled LSU. Uh, but the Skip Burton era and, and, and how baseball was, was, uh, was really, again, a sport of the SEC and the South, that's over now. Again, everybody's fielding teams now. Everybody thinks they have a chance to get the college. And you have series. 70 programs, give or take, a year that, that could probably win the, the yeah. College World Series. I yeah. mean, he had Stony Brook making a College World Series. He has Coastal Carolina. <laughs> yes. I coach to coach all these California state right. schools. Uh, this is a new age. It's fun. That's yeah. why the sport's so, so fun to okay. watch right now. Now, as soon as you finish here, you're heading to go do I'm, a radio I'm, I'm show, jetting, right? Yeah. Tell the folks. All right, yeah. We're doing a show tonight here uh, in about an hour on WWL Radio. Uh, it's uh, the last lap, 8 to 11 on WWL. Come join us. Seth, thanks for joining us all tonight. Right. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a 
rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLAE TV at 10 p.m. Also on Pelican Sports Television every Friday night, 9 o'clock on, on Pelican Sports Television. That is statewide. You can always catch us on, uh, on the internet uh, at ericasher.com or all the previous episodes are there. Also, you can catch me on the radio, Sports 1280, 101.1 FM HD2 in the iHeartRadio app. You can listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com. As mentioned, all the previous episodes inside New Orleans Sports are there as well. Also, special thanks to our WLA production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Claudia Lopez, uh, Alex Chacon, uh, Naila Jones, I got it all in, and my director, William Hill. Thanks to this guy, best in the business, Seth Dunlap. I'm Eric Asher. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports.